each man must do his bit. Welcome to another edition of the Public Interest. My name is David Granger. And in this series of programs, we continue to examine matters of public interest and particularly the human condition in Guyana today. And uh, at this moment, we would like to look more closely at the situation about children. Of course, without our children, there'd be no, no adults, no country in, in Guyana. Now there are about 225,000 children. That is persons, according to the United Nations, persons who are below the age of 18. It means that a girl child who is 17 is a child. She's 12, 13, she's a child. So you don't become an adult uh, until age 18. But children in Guyana have an absolute uh, right, you know, not a partial right, an absolute right to be to have a happy childhood. And their experiences in the early years will have an impact on the rest of their lives. And the first thousand, ye- thousand days, the first thousand days are a period during which a child is relatively helpless and has to be cared for, has to be controlled. And that child is at the mercy of the, the, the conduct and behavior of others, good or bad. If you have ever held a child in your hands, you know, you cannot help but feel how helpless that child is. And for the first thousand days, that child has to be cared for by adults. Uh, Children who have an unhappy first thousand days, you know, will have possibly a difficult time for the rest of their lives. And let us look at the factors which affect a child's upbringing. Um, there, there are, of course, many factors. You know, you cannot decide what takes place in every single home. But let us try to isolate five, what I call five important factors. The first is education. And of course, the deficiency in education. Children should benefit from policies aimed at ensuring that they get to school. Uh, They must get access, and of course, once they get access, they must be able to attend. Once they attend, we expect that there will be achievement. What I call the three A's, access, attendance, and achievement. And it is, of course, the state's responsibility and society's responsibility to make sure every child gets to school. Um, that is one of the reasons why um, my administration, the AP and UAFC administration, actually launched the PETS, the Public Education Transportation Service. There are other initiatives, but the PETS was important in getting children to school free. Um, well, we call it you know, the 3B system, then the 5B system, but we gave children thousands of bicycles. We provided buses. All you have to do is turn up in, in school uniform and jump on a bus uh, uh, to go to school. Or if you're living in riverine areas like the Pomeroon, for example, um, you know, there were boats. Every river, every major river, uh, Demaraya, Sikwebo, Burbis, um, Pomeroon, Kanji had boats. And children were able to jump on the boats free of charge and, and, and go to school. So that was part of the education plan. And later on, later on, especially after it was clear that Guyana was on the way to becoming a, a petroleum state, I announced um, that every village, every village should have a nursery school. So it means that the child doesn't have to travel, you know, halfway across the region just to get to a nursery school. Every village should be, you know, given, uh, provided with a nursery school um, so that the, a child shouldn't have to walk very far, maybe 10 minutes in any direction to get to nursery school. Um, I think there are just about 380 nursery schools in Guyana. Uh, when you think of a population of 225,000 means that many children don't actually go to nursery school. And that's a pity. Uh, But we must aim at 
well, certainly for me, every village must have a nursery school. So mothers uh, particularly should be able to leave their children safely within a short distance from their home. Um, they might have to travel longer to get to a secondary school, a longer distance, but certainly we expect that every village, however small, um, must have a, a nursery school. And don't forget that in the indigenous communities, in the hinterland communities, you've got over 212 villages. And then, of course, the rural areas. So you can see that many areas do not have village primary schools. And um, it means that children don't get the start that they need, you know, especially in terms of education. The second problem affecting children in Guyana is the question of exploitation and abuse. Children are not savvy to the ways of adults, and many of them suffer abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, verbal abuse. Um, they sometimes have to live in a, ho a home, or a household, where there is constant quarreling uh, and sometimes fights and sometimes, you know, physical injury, um, domestic violence. Uh, they cannot defend themselves because they're small and weak. Uh, so the statistics don't lie. Uh, the the CPA, uh, the Child Protection Agency, reports about 18 cases of child sexual abuse every week. So every you know, every 12 hours, you know, some child is being abused somewhere in Guyana. Every day, you know, 10 children are abused. And the CPA, the uh, Child Protection Agency, recorded 2,300 cases of neglect and abuse um, so far for this year. 2,000, over 2,000 cases of neglect and abuse of children in Guyana this year. And the year isn't finished as yet. Uh, the third factor which affects children is the question of poverty. And as we know, about 36% of the entire population subsists in poverty, that means to say, they live on less than 400 Guyana dollars a day. It is likely, therefore, that the child will be malnourished. And very frequently, many children are forced to go out on the street to work, to buy stuff that the family needs, particularly food stuff. And of course, they need more than that. They need to get, you know, um, you know, clothing and other amenities. So poor families are likely to, you know, have children who are themselves are poor. And as I said once, you know, poverty tends to be hereditary. Poor parents have poor children. And when those children grow up poor, it is quite likely that their children too would be poor. So you have, it's not a cycle, but you have a continuum of, of a, hereditary poverty. The, the fourth problem that ch uh, children have is health. And uh, there's a high rate of morbidity and mortality, especially for children in the first five years of their life. Excuse me. <coughs> uh, children in Guyana have the 14th highest rate of child marriage. And the, the fact about it, you know, I'm not a, a doctor, but uh, a woman's body um, is probably not ready for childbearing before the age of 20 or 21. So when you have child marriages and they get children, um, it means that, you know, the child would probably suffer, and very frequently, maybe too frequently, the mothers die or the children die in childbirth. 30% of Guyanese girls are in a union, presumably a sexual union, or they're married as children before the age of 18. 
So health suffers. And very frequently in some areas, in some hinterland areas particularly, apart from malnourishment, they may be uh, victims of uh, vector-borne diseases such as malaria. And it means that their lives could be shortened or made more miserable. And sometimes the drinking water is contaminated in mining areas um, because you know there's effluent from the from the land from the mines um, in, in the rivers which uh, people in hinterland areas depend on. So these are some of the problems: education problems. We can't get enough children in school. Exploitation and abuse at home. Poverty. And of course, they're poor, there's poor health. The fifth problem is that there is social exclusion and discrimination. Sometimes children with disabilities are, are laughed at, they're scorned. Um, and you know, the other children in schools could could be very cruel, very inventive, you know, if somebody has maybe a short leg or something, say, oh, he hop on the drop. Or if persons have you know, some impairment if they're visually impaired or if they stammer, they could be laughed at by other, other students and sometimes they could be bullied. Uh, they could have learning deficiencies. Sometimes the child may not learn because he can't see properly. You know, the other children will laugh at him, but until he gets a pair of spectacles, then he can see clearly what's written on the blackboard or, or what's written in the books. And um, what we have, in addition to that, is that there is a significant number of people who live on the streets, or uh, some of them are of the streets. You know, sometimes parents, you know, out of need. You know, I'm, I'm not criticizing the parents; they would send their child out to beg, or to see if they could, you know, raise money one way or the other. And um, maybe they can go home to, to sleep at night, and then morning comes, they have to go on the street again. Uh, some of them don't actually have, have a home to go to because of some martial, but some people run away from home because of the cruelty and abuse in, in the homes. Uh, so you see the, well, of course, the statistics say they're just about the 130, 140 street children, but, you know, I think if you go to Georgetown, if you go to New Amsterdam and Caribbean, you see perhaps 140 is is, 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 is an understatement. And it's very likely too that children would suffer from poor hygiene because you know they don't bathe, they don't have proper personal hygiene, sanitation, they don't wash their clothes, brush their teeth. Um, they sleep on the sidewalks, the pavements, on a piece of cardboard, and that could be horror during the rainy weather. Uh, in some people's houses are flooded, much as the pavements. And it's quite likely they don't go to school because they might be embarrassed up here, barefooted or you know, dirty, unwashed clothing at school. So in addition to being poor and being treated as outcasts by cleaner, cleaner um, children, you know, they end up, you know, not getting the benefit of education. So it is possible that while still children, um, before they become adolescents, before they become a, a adults, they have to endure emotional, uh, sometimes sexual uh, and verbal abuse and they survive by begging or stealing. Living on the street isn't easy. And after people have lived on the street for a few years, it is difficult for them to stay in a home because the street um, creates the illusion of freedom. And sometimes you try to put those street children in, into homes and they, and they escape to go and try the hand on the street. So whatever they earn, they spend how they like, and eat what they like, sleep when they like, you know, go and come as they like. It's a false freedom, of course, because it can't last. 
and as they become older, you know, street children become more alienated um, from society. And uh, unfortunately, they may end up in some other institution. As you know, in the 19th century, you know, the, the Escobar White School at, uh, on the Neeming in Region 2 was created to deal with uh, delinquent uh, young people, delinquent juveniles, and now there's one in Sophia. And of course, as I pointed out on another occasion, um, now over 60% of the inmates in the prisons are, are young adults. So that is a sad testimony on, you know, what is happening to Guyanese society. Yes, it is true that there are many organizations and institutions um, to provide for, for children. Um, yes, there is the United Nations Convention on the Rights of a Child, which is good. It protects children's rights and interests. There is the Geneva Declaration on the Rights of the Child. This is you know, almost 100 years old. It was promulgated in 1924. And it recognizes that mankind, all mankind, in every country, um, owes the child the best, BESD, the best that it can give. And we must remember that. The child is not um, uh, a human being who should be ignored because that child has to be properly educated and, and, and cared for. And a hundred years ago, the international community was, was proclaiming that the child deserves the best materially and, and spiritually. That child must not be hungry. If that child is hungry, the child must be fed. If that child is sick, um, the child must be nursed. If that child is backward at school, the child must be helped uh, to overcome his or her learning, learning uh, challenges. If the child is delinquent, um, we must try to help that child to get back to the straight and narrow path. If that child is orphaned, you know, due to no fault of his or her own, um, because of disease, you know, the parents may, may, may have died or may have migrated and the child may be abandoned. Again, we must think of ensuring that society accepts responsibility for all children regardless of religion, regardless of uh, which region they're living in, regardless of their race, regardless of their, their and of course, many of them will end up being in the lowest rungs of the social ladder. But we must be prepared to give the children the shelter and the support and the succor that they require, you know, to become useful citizens and to have full lives. You know, get married, have children, and um, enjoy the good life. Children have benefited from um, several institutions. As you know, um, our administration, the APN UFC Coalition, uh, established six uh, child advocacy centers um, for victims of sexual abuse. It's a pity that we have to be focusing so much on negative things which happen to, ch to children. But, you know, in this program, we're trying to, you know, reinforce the idea that children must be protected because they're so vulnerable. There's no point saying nice things and assuming that oh, children are doing well and we can ignore them. Children as a whole need to be assured of the protection of the whole society. And we did set up in the APN UFC, we did set up child advocacy centers. We did set up early childhood development centers, particularly in region two, um, that is the Pamelun Supernam, and, and region six, East Papis Quarantine. Um, so our period is one in which uh, we pay a lot of attention to children and to education. And of course, you know, um, the, the first children's court was established um, by the judiciary, and this is a, a place, an environment which is friendly um, to children, not um, a harsh, cold, uh, you know, law court. But if you visit them, if you check the, the media, you'd see that children could, well, I don't want to say happy, 
children don't feel um, that they are in an alien environment and that they uh, are going to be punished. Um, but there is now a children's court, and that was opened um, in, in 2018 um, to ensure that there is rehabilitative and restorative judgment, you know, um, justice for children. And unfortunately, there's the sexual offenses, offenses court, which, you know, deals with, with uh, particularly young girls, but now young boys are being trafficked as well. Um, and these are being provided uh, with, with additional resources. The legislative framework is strong, but you know, laws don't enforce themselves. The constitution protects children. The constitution states that the best interest of the child shall be the primary consideration in all judicial proceedings. What is best for the child? And in every matter that comes to the court, all matters concerning children, um, whether undertaken by public or private institutions, um, the main concern should be what is best for the child. Um, and that comes straight from the Constitution. Children are protected by law. Um, there is the Status of Children Act which provides for the equal status of children. They're not subhumans, they're equals. The Protection of Children Act, which provides for children's protection from threatening situations, and which allows for vulnerable children to be assisted or cared for. There's the Adoption of Children Act, providing for the orderly adoption of children. There's the Sexual Offenses Act, which provides for protecting young persons from, from sexual abuse. Um, and from sexual exploitation. Whether they're trafficked or not, this can happen in the home. Um, and there could be you know, cases of incest and, and abuse right in the home, uh, country, uh, town, or hinterland. Then there's the Child Care and Protection Agency Act, the CPA Act, which provides for safeguarding children's rights and welfare. Then there's the Custody, Contact, Guardianship, and Maintenance Act, which provides for granting custody, contact, and guardianship of, uh, of children. Then there's the Combating in, 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 of Trafficking in Persons Act, providing for the protection of children um, from human trafficking. Uh, but not only in the hinterland, but of course, people could be trafficked. You know, there have been cases where we've from on the coast, uh, Region 2, Region 6, and elsewhere, I'm not trying to blame any region. Children have been trafficked from you know, their homes and to go and work in, in restaurants as waitresses. And uh, when they turn up there, they're sometimes subject to, to abuse. And that's a form of trafficking. You, you don't have to be taken far away in the hinterland. Uh, you could be trafficked on the coast. And, and, in night spots, when on the age girls particularly, and sometimes boys, you know, are subject of, of abuse. Then there's the Juvenile Justice Act, which provides for the establishment of facilities for the custody and the education and rehabilitation of juvenile offenders. And of course, you know, there's the uh, there's the Sophia Detention Center, and there's the New Opportunity Corps, and there is the Timeri Prison for. for started out with juveniles, but uh, children don't belong in jails, children belong in schools. And this is something we must try to avoid, but uh, the law protects them. And uh, we must, as members of society, extend that protection to all juveniles. Where are children going in Guyana? There's no future for Guyana without children. <laughs> you know, children get, become older, old people, eventually will be removed um, by the hand of God from the face of the earth. And their places will be taken by the children who are, to, who are today young, but they grow old every day. And we must think of how best to protect them. Laws which provide for child care and protection are only as effective 
as their enforcement. I know the, the, the police are doing all sorts of things, men on mission and so on. We need people in the police force, in all these agencies who protect children. Those are the people who should be protected. Children's um, protection is, is top priority. That's what the constitution says. That's what the law says. Okay, I'm not saying that we should abandon men, but the top priority is protection of children and enforcing the law. And the police force particularly must be modified in ways, even by recruiting more female police officers or um, ensuring that um, facilities exist for persons who are rescued from, from uh, you know, bad situations. You know, if, for example, you know, you have, um, now you have uh, police divisions in every region, it means if children are rescued from uh, a situation of being trafficked, there must be places in that police station or in that community where those uh, children, uh, whether, whether boys or girls, could be housed and kept safely and not put in the lockups or left on a bench in the police station. These are things that must be planned for. Um, the police must be a force with a mission to protect um, children. Laws should be complemented by plans and pro policies and programs. You can't uh, expect the law to enforce itself. Laws must be backed up by some mechanisms for implementation. Um, especially for victims of abuse, um, especially for strengthening um, child care and protection. Laws are necessary, but they're not sufficient. There must be implementation if children are to have that good life, if we are to reduce abuse. Children will benefit from policies, from improved management of the child care facilities. They will benefit from policies for teen teenage mothers, helping to reintegrate them into the education system, to allow them to resume or to continue their education. Children will benefit from policies which support those who have been deprived of adequate parental care. Children will benefit from policies which prevent child labor. Um, and uh, you can see the children belong in schools, they don't belong in the mines or belong in, you know, working in restaurants. And uh, children will benefit from policies which encouraging, which encourages good parenting practices. You know, parents with a mission, parents, men and women who could come together to strengthen family life. Children need the attention and protection of adults within the home and outside of the home. Every generation, every generation has a duty to care for and to protect its children. You know, I just imagine a picture of a mother hen with the chicks, you know, very protective. Um, children need the protection of adults. It is a, a responsibility that is shared. And children who are weak and uh, maybe immature cannot be left on their own. They need the support of the family. They need the support of the community. They need the support of society. My friends, uh, this is not to blame central government, but central government must step forward. Regional democratic councils, RDCs, must accept their responsibility for the children. NDCs must accept their responsibility for children in their neighborhoods now that local government is in the air. Um, we must ensure that children receive the best care possible in every single neighborhood, in every village, and they're not discriminated against. I remember growing up, and perhaps you remember too, the song of Guyana's children, um, a very moving patriotic song. And we were all inspired in those days to show what Guyana's sons and daughters can be. 
And this is our mission, to show what Guyana's sons and daughters can be. Thank you, and may God bless you.